Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter Five. We slumped back against the railing and scooted down until we were seated beside each other, exhausted and dazed. We had escaped the Darkling, but we were on a strange ship, surrounded by a bunch of crazed Grisha dressed as sailors and howling like mad dogs. You all right? Mal asked. I nodded. The wound in my shoulder felt like it was on fire, but I was unhurt and my whole body was thrumming from using my power again. You? I asked. Not a scratch on me, Mal said in disbelief. The ship rode the waves at seemingly impossible speed, driven forward by squalors and what I realized were tide makers. As the terror and thrill of battle receded, I noticed I was soaked. My teeth began to chatter. Mal put his arm around me, and at some point, one of the crew dropped a blanket over us. Finally, Sturmhung called a halt and ordered the sails trimmed. The squalors and tide makers dropped their arms and fell against each other, completely spent. Their power had left their faces glowing, their eyes alight. The schooner slowed until it rocked gently in what suddenly seemed like an overwhelming silence. Keep a watch, Sturmhan commanded, and Privet sent a sailor up into the shrouds with a long glass. Mal and I slowly got to our feet. Sturmhan walked down the row of exhausted ethereal kai, clapping squalors and tide makers on the back and saying quiet words to a few of them. I saw him directing injured sailors below decks, where I assumed they'd be seen by a ship surgeon or maybe a corporal rocky healer. The privateer seemed to have every kind of Grisha in his employ. Then Sturmhan strode toward me, pulling a knife from his belt. My hands went up and Mal stepped in front of me, leveling his rifle at Sturmhan's chest. Instantly, I heard swords being drawn and pistols cocking all around us as the crew drew their weapons. Easy, Oretsev, Sturmhan said, his steps slowing. I've just gone to a lot of trouble and expense to put you on my ship. Be ashamed to fill you full of holes now. He flipped the knife over, offering the hilt to me. This is for the beast. The sea whip. In the excitement of the battle, I'd almost forgotten. Mal hesitated, then cautiously lowered his rifle. Stand down, Sturmhan instructed to his crew. They holstered their pistols and put up their swords. Sturmhan nodded to Tamar. Haul it in. On Tamar's orders, a group of sailors leaned over the starboard rail and unlashed a complex webbing of ropes. They heaved and slowly raised the sea whip's body over the schooner's side. It thumped to the deck, still struggling weakly in the silvery confines of the net. It gave a vicious thrash, its huge teeth snapping. We all jumped back. As I understand it, you have to be the one, said Sturmhan, holding the knife out to me once more. I eyed the privateer, wondering how much he might know about amplifiers, and this amplifier in particular. Go on, he said, we need to get moving. The Darkling ship is disabled, but it won't stay that way. The blade in Sturmhan's hand gleamed dully in the sun. Grisha steel. Somehow I wasn't surprised. Still, I hesitated. I just lost thirteen good men, Sturmhan said quietly. Don't tell me it was all for nothing. I looked at the sea whip. It lay twitching on the deck, air fluttering through its gills, its red eyes cloudy but still full of rage. I remembered the stag's dark, steady gaze, the quiet panic of its final moments. The stag had lived so long in my imagination that, when it had finally stepped from the trees and into the snowy glade, it had been almost familiar to me, known. The sea whip was a stranger, more myth than reality, despite the sad and solid truth of its broken body. Either way, it won't survive, the privateer said. I grasped the knife's hilt. It felt heavy in my hand. Is this mercy? It certainly wasn't the same mercy I had shown Moroz of a stag. Rusalai, the cursed prince, guardian of the bone road. In the stories, he lured lonely maidens onto his back and carried them, laughing, over the waves until they were too far from shore to cry for help. Then he dove down, dragging them beneath the surface to his underwater palace. The girls wasted away, for there was nothing to eat there but coral and pearls. Rusalai wept and sang his mournful song over their bodies, then returned to the surface to claim another queen. Just stories, I told myself. It's not a prince, just an animal in pain. The sea whip's sides heaved. It snapped its jaws uselessly in the air. Two harpoons extended from its back, watery blood trickling from the wounds. I held up the knife, unsure of what to do, where to put the blade. My arm shook. The sea whip gave a wheezing, pitiful sigh, a weak echo of that magical choir. Mal strode forward. End it, Alina, he said hoarsely, for saint's sake. He pulled the knife from my grip and dropped it to the deck. He took hold of my hands and closed them over the shaft of one of the harpoons. With one clean thrust, we drove it home. The sea whip shuddered and then went still, its blood pooling on the deck. Mal looked down at his hands, then wiped them on his torn shirt and turned away. Tolia and Tamar came forward. My stomach churned. I knew what had to come next. That isn't true, said a voice in my head. You can walk away. Leave it be. Again, I had the sense that things were moving too fast. But I couldn't just throw an amplifier like this back into the sea. The dragon had already given up its life. 
and taking the amplifier didn't necessarily mean that I would use it. The sea whip scales were an iridescent white that shimmered with soft rainbows, except for a single strip that began between its large eyes and ran over the ridge of its skull onto its soft mane. Those were edged in gold. Tamar slid a dagger from her belt and, with Toya's help, worked the scales free. I didn't let myself look away. When they were done, they handed me seven perfect scales, still wet with blood. Let us bow our heads for the men lost today, Sturmhan said. Good sailors, good soldiers. Let the sea carry them to safe harbor, and may the saints receive them on a brighter shore. He repeated the sailor's prayer in Kerch, then Tamar murmured the words in Shu. For a moment, we stood on the rocking ship, heads bent. A lump rose in my throat. More men dead and another magical ancient creature gone, its body desecrated by Grisha's steel. I lay my hand on the sea whip shimmering hide. It was cool and slick beneath my fingers. Its red eyes were cloudy and blank. I gripped the golden scales on my palm, feeling their edges dig into my flesh. What saints waited for creatures like this? A long minute passed and then Sturmhan murmured, Saints receive them. Saints receive them, replied the crew. We need to move, Sturmhan said quietly. The whaler's hull was cracked, but the Darkling has squalors and a fabricator or two, and for all I know, those monsters of his can be trained to use a hammer and nails. Let's not take any chances. He turned to Priviet. Give the squalors a few minutes to rest and get me a damage report, then make sail. Da, Capitan, Priviet responded crisply. He hesitated. Capitan. Could be people will pay good money for dragon scales, no matter the color. Sturmhan frowned, but then gave a terse nod. Take what you want, then clear the deck and get us moving. You have our coordinates. Several of the crew fell on the sea whip's body to cut away its scales. This I couldn't watch. I turned my back on them, my gut in knots. Sturmhan came up beside me. Don't judge them too harshly, he said, glancing over his shoulder. It's not them I'm judging, I said. You're the captain. And they have purses to fill, parents and siblings to feed. We just lost nearly half our crew and took no rich prize to ease the sting. Not that you aren't fetching. What am I doing here, I asked. Why did you help us? Are you so sure I have? Answer the question, Sturmhan, said Mal, joining us. Why hunt the sea whip if you only meant to turn it over to Alina? I wasn't hunting the sea whip. I was hunting you. That's why you raised a mutiny against the Darkling, I asked, to get at me? You can't very well mutiny on your own ship. Call it what you like, I said, exasperated. Just explain yourself. Sturmhan leaned back and rested his elbows on the rail, surveying the deck. As I would have explained to the Darkling had he bothered to ask, which, thankfully, he didn't, the problem with hiring a man who sells his honor is that you can always be outbid. I gaped at him. You betrayed the Darkling for money? Betrayed seems a strong word. I hardly know the fellow. You're mad, I said. You know what he can do. No prize is worth that. Sturmhan grinned. That remains to be seen. The Darkling will hunt you for the rest of your days. Then you and I will have something in common, won't we? Besides, I like to have powerful enemies. Makes me feel important. Mal crossed his arms and considered the privateer. I can't decide if you're crazy or stupid. I have so many good qualities, Sturmhan said. It can be hard to choose. I shook my head. The privateer was out of his mind. If the Darkling was outbid, then who hired you? Where are you taking us? First answer a question for me, Sturmhan said, reaching into his frock coat. He drew a little red volume from his pocket and tossed it to me. Why was the Darkling carrying this around with him? He doesn't strike me as the religious type. I caught it and turned it over, but I already knew what it was. Its gold lettering sparkled in the sun. You stole it, I asked, and a number of other documents from his cabin. Although, again, since it was technically my cabin, I'm not sure you can call it theft. Technically, I observed in irritation, the cabin belongs to the whaling captain you stole the ship from. Fair enough, admitted Sturmhand. If this whole Sun Summoner thing doesn't work out, you might consider a career as a barrister. You seem to have the carping disposition. But I should point out that this actually belongs to you. He reached out and flipped the book open. My name was inscribed inside the cover, Alina Starkov. I tried to keep my face blank, but my mind was suddenly racing. This was my Astori Sanctia, the very copy the opera had given me months ago in the library of the Little Palace. The Darkling would have had my room searched after I fled Ozalta, but why take this book? And why had he been so concerned that I might have read it? I thumbed through the pages. The volume was beautifully illustrated, though given that it was meant for children, it was awfully gruesome. Some of the saints were depicted performing miracles or acts of charity. Sanct Felix among the apple boughs. Sancta Anastasia ridding our cask of the wasting plague, but most of the pages showed the saints in their martyrdoms. Sancta Elisabetta being drawn and quartered, the beheading of Sancta Lubav, Sancta Ilya in chains. I froze. 
This time I could not disguise my reaction. Interesting, no, said Sturmhond. He tapped the page with one long finger. Unless I'm very much mistaken, that's the creature we just captured. There was no hiding it. Behind Sankt Ilya, splashing around in the waves of a lake or an ocean, was the distinctive shape of the sea whip. Somehow, I kept my hand from straying to the collar at my neck. I shut the book and shrugged. Just another story. Mal shot me a baffled look. I didn't know if he'd seen what was on that page. I didn't want to return the story Sankt Ilya to Sturmhond, but he was already suspicious enough. I made myself hold it out to him, hoping he didn't see the tremor in my hand. Sturmhond studied me, then levered himself up and shook out his cuffs. Keep it. It is yours, after all. As I'm sure you've noticed, I have a deep respect for personal property. Besides, you'll need something to keep you occupied until we get to Oscurvo. Mal and I both gave a start. You're taking us to West Ravka? I asked. I'm taking you to meet my client, and that's really all I can tell you. Who is he? What does he want from me? Are you so sure it's a he? Maybe I'm delivering you to the feared and queen. Are you? No, but it's always wise to keep an open mind. I blew out a frustrated breath. Do you ever answer a question directly? Hard to say. Ah, there, I've done it again. I turned to Mal, fist clenched. I'm going to kill him. Answer the question, Sturmhond, Mal growled. Sturmhond lifted a brow. Two things you should know, he said, and this time I heard that hint of steel in his voice. One, captains don't like taking orders on their own ships. Two, I'd like to offer you a deal. Mal snorted. Why would we ever trust you? You don't have much choice, Sturmhond said pleasantly. I'm well aware that you could sink this ship and consign us all to the watery deep, but I hope you'll take your chances with my client. Listen to what he has to say. If you don't like what he proposes, I swear to help you make your escape. Take you anywhere in the world. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So you crossed the dark lane and now you're going to turn right around and betray your new client too? Not at all, said Sturmhond, genuinely affronted. My client paid me to get you to Ravka, not to keep you there. That would be extra. I looked at Mal. He lifted his shoulder and said, He's a liar and probably insane, but he's also right. We don't have much choice. I rubbed my temples. I felt a headache coming on. I was tired and confused, and Sturmhan had a way of talking that made me want to shoot someone. Preferably him. But he'd freed us from the Darkling, and once Mel and I were off his ship, we might find our own way to escape. For now, I couldn't think much beyond that. All right, I said. He smiled. So good to know you won't be drowning us all. He beckoned a deckhand who had been hovering nearby. Fetch Tamar and tell her she'll be sharing her quarters with the summoner, he instructed. Then he pointed to Mal. He can stay with Toya. Before Mal could open his mouth to protest, Sturmhorn forestalled him. That's the way of things on this ship. I'm giving you both free run of the Volkvalny until we reach Ravka, but I beg you not to trifle with my generous nature. The ship has rules and I have limits. You and me both, Mal said through gritted teeth. I laid my hand on Mal's arm. I would have felt safer staying together, but this wasn't the time to quibble with the privateer. Let it go, I said. I'll be fine. Mal scowled, then turned on his heel and strode across the deck, disappearing into the ordered chaos of rope and sail. I took a step after him. Might want to leave him alone, Sturmhorn said. That type needs plenty of time for brooding and self-recrimination. Otherwise, they get cranky. Do you take anything seriously? Not if I can help it. It makes life so tedious. I shook my head. This client... Don't bother asking. Needless to say, I've had plenty of bitters. You're in very high demand since you disappeared from the fold. Of course, most people think you're dead. It tends to drive the price down. Try not to take it personally. I looked across the deck to where the crew were hefting the sea whip's body over the ship's rail. With a straining heave, they rolled it over the side of the schooner. It struck the water with a loud splash. That quickly, Rusalai was gone, swallowed by the sea. A long whistle blew. The crewmen scattered to their stations, and the squallers took their places. Seconds later, the sails bloomed like great white flowers. The schooner was once more on its way, tacking southeast to Ravka, to home. "'What are you going to do with those scales?' Sturmhorn asked. "'I don't know. Don't you? Despite my dazzling good looks, I'm not quite the pretty fool I appear to be. The Darkling intended for you to wear the sea-whip scales. So why didn't he kill it? When the Darkling had murdered the stag and placed marots of his collar around my neck, he'd bound us forever.' I shivered, remembering the way he had reached across that connection, seizing hold of my power as I stood by, helpless. Would the dragon scales have given him the same control? And if so, why not take it? I already have an amplifier, I said. A powerful one, if the stories are true. The most powerful amplifier the world had ever known. So the Darkling had told me, and so I believed. But what if there was more to it? What if I had only touched the beginnings of the stag's power? I shook my head. That was madness. Amplifiers can't be combined. 
I saw the book, he replied. It certainly looks like they can. I felt the weight of the Astori Sanctia in my pocket. Had the Darkling feared I might learn Morozova's secrets from the pages of a children's book? You don't understand what you're saying, I told Sturmhond. No Grisha has ever taken a second amplifier. The risks. Now, that's a word best not used around me. I tend to be overfond of risk. Not this kind, I said grimly. Pity, he murmured. If the Darkling catches up to us, I doubt this ship or this crew will survive another battle. A second amplifier might even the odds. Better yet, give us an edge. I do so hate a fair fight. Or it could kill me, or sink the ship, or create another shadow fold, or worse. You certainly have a flair for the dire. My fingers snaked into my pocket, seeking out the damp edges of the scales. I had so little information, and my knowledge of Grisha theory was sketchy at best. But this rule had always seemed fairly clear. One Grisha, one amplifier. I remembered the words from one of the convoluted philosophy texts I'd been required to read. Why can a Grisha possess but one amplifier? I will answer this question instead. What is infinite, the universe and the greed of men? I needed time to think. Will you keep your word, I said at last? Will you help us escape? I didn't know why I bothered asking. If he intended to betray us, he certainly wouldn't say so. I expected him to reply with some kind of joke, so I was surprised when he said, Are you so eager to leave your country behind once again? I stilled. All the while your country suffers. The Darkling had accused me of abandoning Ravka. He was wrong about a lot of things, but I couldn't help feeling that he was right about that. I'd left my country to the mercy of the Shadowfold, to a weak king and grasping tyrants like the Darkling and the Operat. Now, if the rumors could be believed, the Fold was expanding and Ravka was falling apart. Because of the Darkling. Because of the Caller. Because of me. I lifted my face to the sun, feeling the rush of sea air over my skin, and said, I'm eager to be free. As long as the Darkling lives, you'll never be free, and neither will your country. You know that. I'd considered the possibility that Stormhond was greedy or stupid, but it hadn't occurred to me that he might actually be a patriot. He was Ravkin, after all, and even if his exploits had lined his own pockets, they'd probably done more to help his country than all of the feeble Ravkin army. I want the choice, I said. You'll have it, he replied, on my word as a liar and a cutthroat. He set off across the deck, but then turned back to me. You're right about one thing, Summoner. The Darkling is a powerful enemy. You might want to think about making some powerful friends. I wanted nothing more than to pull the copy of the Astori Sanctia from my pocket and spend an hour studying the illustration of Sanct Ilya, but Tamar was already waiting to escort me to her quarters. Sturmhorn's schooner wasn't at all like the sturdy merchant ship that had carried Mal and me to Novi Zim or the clunky whaler we'd just left behind. It was sleek, heavily armed, and beautifully built. Tamar told me that he'd captured the schooner from a Zemini pirate who was picking off Rofkin ships near the ports of the southern coast. Sturmhahn had liked the vessel so much that he'd taken it for his own flagship and renamed it the Volkvoni, Wolf of the Waves. Wolves, Stormhond, the red dog in the ship's flag. At least I knew why the crew were always howling and yapping. Every inch of the space on the schooner was put to good use. The crew slept on the gun deck. In case of engagement, their hammocks could be quickly stowed and the cannon slotted into place. I'd been right about the fact that, with Korporaki on board, there was no need for an Akazatsia surgeon. The doctor's quarters and supply room had been turned into Tamar's berth. The cabin was tiny, with barely enough room for two hammocks and a chest. The walls were lined with cupboards and full of unused ointments and salves, arsenic powder, tincture of lead antimony. I balanced carefully in one of the hammocks, my feet resting on the floor, acutely conscious of the red book tucked inside my coat as I watched Tamar throw open the lid of her trunk and began divesting herself of weapons. The brace of pistols that crossed her chest, two slender axes from her belt, a dagger from her boot, and another from the sheath secured around her thigh. She was a walking armory. I feel sorry for your friend, she said, as she pulled what looked like a sock full of ball bearings from one of her pockets. It hit the bottom of the chest with a loud thunk. Why? I asked, making a circle on the planks with the toe of my boot. My brother snores like a drunk bear. I laughed. Mal snores too. Then they can perform a duet. She disappeared and then returned a moment later with a bucket. The tide makers filled the rain barrel, she said. Feel free to wash if you like. Fresh water was usually a luxury aboard ship, but I supposed that with Grisha and the crew, there would be no need to ration it. She dunked her head in the bucket and ruffled her short, dark hair. He's handsome, the tracker. I rolled my eyes. You don't say. Not my type, but handsome. My brow shot up. In my experience, Mal was just about everyone's type but I wasn't going to start asking Tamar personal questions. If Sturmhond couldn't be trusted, then neither could his crew, and I didn't need to grow attached to any of them. I'd learned my lesson with Jenya, and one shattered friendship was enough. Instead, I said, there are Kirch and Stormhond's crew. 
Aren't they superstitious about having a girl on board? Sturmhorn does things his own way. And they don't bother you? Tamar grinned, her white teeth flashing against her bronze skin. She tapped the gleaming shark's tooth hanging around her neck, and I realized it was an amplifier. No, she said simply. Ah. Faster than I could blink, she pulled yet another knife from her sleeve. This comes in handy, too, she said. However do you choose, I breathed faintly. Depends on my mood. Then she flipped the knife over in her hand and offered it to me. Sturmhorn's given orders that you're to be left alone, but just in case someone gets drunk and forgetful, do you know how to take care of yourself? I nodded. I didn't walk around with thirty knives hidden about my person, but I wasn't completely incompetent. She dunked her head again, then said, They're throwing dice above deck, and I'm ready for my ration. You can come if you like. I didn't much care for gambling or rum, but I was still tempted. My whole body was crackling with the feeling of using my power against the Nichevoya. I was restless and positively famished for the first time in weeks, but I shook my head. No thanks. Suit yourself. I have debts to collect. Priviet wagered me we wouldn't be coming back. I swear he looked like a mourner at a funeral when we came over that rail. He bet you'd be killed, I said, aghast. She laughed. I don't blame him. To go up against the Darkling and his Grisha, everyone knew it was suicide. The crew ended up drawing straws to see who got stuck with the honor. And you and your brother are just unlucky? Us? Tamar paused in the doorway. Her hair was damp and the lamplight glinted off her heart render's grin. We didn't draw anything, she said as she stepped through the door. We volunteered. I didn't have a chance to talk to Mal alone until late that night. We'd been invited to dine with Sturmhond in his quarters, and it had been a strange supper. The meal was served by the steward, a servant of impeccable manners, who was several years older than anyone else on the ship. We ate better than we had in weeks. Fresh bread, roasted haddock, pickled radishes, and a sweet iced wine that set my head spinning after just a few sips. My appetite was fierce, as it always was after I'd used my power, but Mal ate little and said less until Sturmhond mentioned the shipment of arms he was bringing back to Rafka. Then he seemed to perk up and they spent the rest of the meal talking about guns, grenades, and exciting ways to make things explode. I couldn't seem to pay attention. As they yammered on about the repeating rifles used on the Zimini frontier, all I could think about were the scales in my pocket and what I intended to do with them. Did I dare claim a second amplifier for myself? I had taken the Sea Whip's life. That meant its power belonged to me. But if the scales functioned like Morozova's collar, then the dragon's power was also mine to bestow. I could give the scales to one of Sturmhorn's heartrenders, maybe even Toya, try to take control of him the way the Darkling had once taken control of me. I might be able to force the privateer to sail us back to Novi's M, but I had to admit that wasn't what I wanted. I took another sip of wine. I needed to talk to Mal. To distract myself, I cataloged the trappings of Sturmhorn's cabin. Everything was gleaming wood and polished brass. The desk was littered with charts, the pieces of a dismembered sextant, and strange drawings of what looked like the hinged wing of a mechanical bird. The table glittered with kerch porcelain and crystal. The wines bore labels in a language I didn't recognize. All plunder, I realized. Sturmhan had done well for himself. As for the captain, I took the opportunity to really look at him for the first time. He was probably four or five years older than I was, and there was something very odd about his face. His chin was overly pointy. His eyes were a muddy green, his hair a peculiar shade of red. His nose looked like it had been broken and badly set several times. At one point, he caught me studying him, and I could have sworn he turned his face away from the light. When we finally left Sturmhan's cabin, it was past midnight. I herded Mal above deck to a secluded spot by the ship's prow. I knew there were men on watch in the foretop above us, but I didn't know when I'd have another chance to get him alone. I like him, Mal was saying, a little unsteady on his feet from the wine. I mean, he talks too much, and he'd probably steal the buttons from your boots, but he's not a bad guy, and he seems to know a lot about... Would you shut up? I whispered. I want to show you something. Mal peered at me blearily. No need to be rude. I ignored him and pulled the red book out of my pocket. Look, I said, holding the page open and casting a glow over Sankt Ilya's exultant face. Mal went still. The stag, he said. And Rusalai. I watched him examine the illustration and saw the moment that realization struck. Saints, he breathed. There's a third.